Thank you for finding chapter 6 in John's Gospel. And as you're finding it, uh, I'll just remind you what we were doing two weeks ago. Um, we were looking into the meaning of Holy Communion, and we had a communion service. Um, here we are again with the communion service this morning. And I want to break open different dimensions of the way in which God feeds us over these months to come and what the deeper meaning of communion is. And you'll remember that uh, two weeks ago we were looking specifically about how eating the bread and drinking the cup of wine as Jesus' body and his blood is the way in which, the supreme way in which God builds unity between heaven and earth and also between one of us and each other. The two dimensions of the cross, the vertical axis, unity between heaven and earth and unity on the horizontal axis between me and you and all of us here on earth. When we eat and drink in remembrance of him in the right spirit, unity comes and barriers that have separated us from God and from each other tumble down. But what I want to look at this morning particularly is the symbolism of the bread and the wine. A symbol points beyond itself to disclose a profound mystery. And as we were saying two weeks ago, when words fall short, symbolic actions continue to speak. Last Sunday, I was thinking with you about the role that silence plays in our worship and in our quest for God. We live with all this urban noise around us. And we need to be silent to hear the voice of the Lord. The bread and the wine are symbols to us in Holy Communion you, in, in rather a similar way to, in, to which the ring that married people wear, I can't get it off now, I wonder if I can get it off, uh, is in marriage. Here is a ring which, tween, which symbolizes, points beyond itself, if I can get it off, there we are, um, the covenant that Margareta and I made on the 17th of August, 1979. The same day your parents were married, same year. No, no, not quite, no, not quite. Right, good day, 17th of August. Um, and um, the, the ring symbolizes the eternal love of God and his life that encompasses our marriage and um, everything that happens in our marriage is encompassed by his love and the ring goes round and round. And this is a covenant, an agreement between Margaret and myself which was made in the presence of God and in the presence of our families and friends. Covenant. And in the same way, when Jesus uh, was instituting the Last Supper with his friends, he also talked about a covenant, didn't he? He said, this is my blood of the new covenant. The blood of a new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. A covenant between heaven and earth. He was referring to Jeremiah chapter 31, 31, when he was in, invoking those words. So the bread and the wine are symbols of a covenant in the same way that the ring in marriage is a symbol of a covenant, an agreement between two parties that is so profound and so important that we need symbols to help us think of it and, and capture what it, the depth of, of what this is. And so if we turn to chapter 6 of John's Gospel, we have one of the richest sources of insight into the bread and the wine of communion in the whole Bible. And interestingly, <laughs> extraordinarily, John has no Last Supper in his Gospel. Did you know that? It's only in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels that we have uh, a mention of the Last Supper. And it's as though in this chapter, this extraordinarily rich chapter of John 6, that we, John 
he shares with us his deepest insights into the meaning of the bread and the wine. Very important passage for us. So it starts in this way. I'm going to read verses 1 to 15. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing those who were ill. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take almost a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. How f how, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the barley, five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus sees the 5,000. He sees their need. He has compassion for them. In one of the other Gospels, it says he sees that they are like sheep without a shepherd. And miraculously, he feeds their meets their needs as the bread and the fish are multiplied with enough to feed everybody. But he knows their thoughts. And as the scriptures tell us, the thoughts of God are not the same thoughts as human thoughts. They, verse 15, this passage just ended, they are wanting a king. They think that the one thing they need as a people is a king, and it would be a king after the mold of King David, a heroic king riding a, a, a war horse, a kind of king who would liberate them from Roman domination. They think this guy can perform amazing miracles, he can feed thousands of people out of a few bits of bread and, and fish, but so that, there's the, the kind of guy we need to be our king who's going to deliver us. How does Jesus react? Be very, very tempting for your average mortal young man of 30, whatever he was, 31 by then, to think, this is cool. Just look how well this is going. This is really cool. I'll be, get made king, and then I'll have a thousand, thousands and thousands of people following me. But no. Jesus withdraws. He completely resists the temptation to be made king. He does not want fame. See how it goes on. Reading now from verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake. When they got into a boat, then they got where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or, th three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, 
it is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord uh, and had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Jesus feeds the 5,000. He refuses to capitalize on what was happening and be made a king. He withdraws. And he leaves them on their own. And he lead, allows them to go into this storm on the boat. And they are filled with terror. He allows them to get to the point in their lives where they recognize their mortality and confront their own potential death out there on the waters. But we find them at the end of this little section searching for him. Jesus then meets up with them in verse 25. We'll continue. Let's see how this rolls on. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the sign I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then Jesus asked him, sorry, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one who was sent, who was sent, the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign will you then give, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. All whom the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I will n shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. So we go on. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the bread in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which people may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Two types of feeding. Jesus feeds the multitude with bread and fish. And they are fed in their bodies. And it's a miracle, a wonderful miracle. Jesus meets their absolute physical need, right? And they don't starve. They're on the mountainside. But Jesus knows already, having performed that miracle, that that's only the tip of the iceberg. Because it's one thing to have your body fed, but it's an entirely different thing to have your deepest spiritual need fed. So that's why, I believe, he, he withdraws when they try to make him a king, because he knows they haven't got it at all yet. They can see he's a miracle worker, but they haven't begun to grasp what it is he's really want, longing to give them. So he goes back in their history, and he talks about the way when the Israelites were passing through the wilderness on their journey from captivity in Egypt and moving on to the Holy Land, how miraculously God met their physical need with manna. And they fed. They went to the loo. And they moved on in their journey. And Jesus says, now, remember that, guys. Remember how your Father in heaven fed, them, fed your ancestors with manna in the in the wilderness, but now I'm talking an, about an entirely different kind of feeding. I'm going to feed you with what your souls need. Your souls need the bread of life. And I, Jesus, am the bread of life. And if you eat of, of me, my bread, you will never die. The disciples, having found it very difficult when he withdrew and having wanted to make him a king, now have another problem. Verse 52. He's told them now that he's the bread of life. And that whoever eats of him will never die. And what does it lead to? Another argument, another problem. 52, verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts it as for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life, yet there are some among you who do not believe. 
gospel, Jesus has known from the, from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you about the one who can come to me, sorry, that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So there's been another row, and now some are walking off. This message is too tough for many of them. You can preach the gospel in your church and empty your church. Jesus, who we can be sure preach the gospel, lost at this point many of his followers, including some of those, it would seem at that point, that have been following him closely as his disciples for three years. We must not measure our success by our numbers. You can do the things of the gospel and create problems for yourself. And there can be a backlash. Here is Jesus losing his followers by the standards of this world becoming unsuccessful. He could have become a king. He could have been crowned by the Jews and become a campaign that the zealots would have loved him be to begin against the Jews, a, a, a military uprising. Many of the Jews would have wanted him to do that. He could have taken that one. Equally, I think this is important, equally he could have gone on performing miraculous miracles and whenever there were hungry people, bang, whoop, another feeding, another 5,000. He could have ridden, risen on the, st on the tide of his success, become even more famous. But... It's so important, I think, we grasp that he refused to go that route because he wanted them to get what this is really about. It's about meeting their deepest, deepest needs. Um, just before the service, when we were praying, we had a picture, two pictures, that I think get this rather well. The first picture was of the House of Commons, and the House of Commons was being plagued by locusts, black locusts. And although the politicians couldn't see the locusts, they were very irritated and fidgety because the locusts they couldn't see were affecting them. So they got up and left. And over the House of Commons was this enormous shiny sword, the length of the commons, double-handed sword. Then the picture moved on to a cathedral, two big cathedrals near the House of Commons, but a cathedral anyway. And in the cathedral was Jesus at the altar operating on people who were sick, not in body, but in soul. Because of, these were the things that were listed, marriage problems, money problems, and work problems. And there was Jesus operating on them and bringing them healing. And as we reflected on this picture, it seemed like God was saying this. Look, there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of this world, the House of Commons, if you like, a necessary kingdom, if you like. And there's the kingdom of God, the cathedral and the House of Commons. And maybe God was saying through this picture, look, the politicians could be busy with the wrong things and judgment can come and they can just, whoa, I don't want to be a politician anymore. It's just all running into the sand. Meanwhile, down the road, there's Jesus in his cathedral just trying to heal people's souls and meet their deepest eternal spiritual needs. Make of that what you like. Just to come back to the word. Here we have Jesus losing his followers, but not losing the plot. 
He wants to meet their deepest, deepest, eternal needs of him, a need that only he can meet. So when we come to the rail to receive the bread, at one level, it's just feeding. It's just a meal. That's what it was at the Last Supper. But at the deepest symbolic level, this is Jesus, the eternal Son of God, wanting to feed our souls that we will have the best possible thing, and that is eternal life. And here the, here, here the symbolism, of course, goes deeper and deeper because the symbolism, the bread comes into your body and is inside you. Physical bread from budgeons, take it in and it goes through. You go to the loo, it keeps you alive a little bit longer. But that's the job done. But Jesus went to all, these tr all this trouble and risked losing all his followers... <laughs> by talking about the living bread that symbolically is a piece of bread but through faith becomes to us his body. So he comes and lives in us and takes up his dwelling place in our souls. And then, though we will get old and die, our souls will live on in all eternity. And it Interesting, he mentions the blood as well in this chapter, doesn't he? Whoever drinks my blood will never die. And if you come back to this point here, verse 66 and 67, when it looks like all his followers are going to leave him because they just can't cope with this teaching, it's just too radical. Imagine the, the young lad from Nazareth, is Joseph's son, as, as it says, saying, I am the bread of life. It's too dramatic and too radical to cope. They couldn't handle it. And they're about to leave him, but he can't compromise on this because he knows it's the truth and it's the one thing they need. So verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Verse 67 now. You too, do you want to leave me? Do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And then Peter, verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Have you come to that point in your life? that when you come to kneel at the altar rail, to stand there and to receive the bread of life, there is nowhere else you can go in Bushmead, Luton, England, the world, that will meet your deepest spiritual need. And actually then you see the question of which particular church you choose to go to is completely irrelevant to this. It doesn't matter which church you go to at one level don't mind. What matters is that you have the faith that only Jesus as the living bread, the bread of life, only he can meet your deepest need. No particular denomination or church or vicar, young or old or handsome or whatever, can meet this need. Only he. And I think he wants to get us to the point, all of us, that we get to the point where we say, well, who else can we go to but you? Because only you have the words of eternal life. And I suspect that our spiritual journey, in a sense, hasn't really begun for any of us until we've got to that point. That no number of songs, or no number of trying different churches, or no number of denominations, or no number of trips to new wine, or no number of anything can meet this need. We don't need a swashbuckling king. We just need him. Because he's the bread of life. They had a lot of trouble getting to this point, didn't they? To 
be able to accept it. They found it very difficult. He, he let them even go out on the lake and, and, and have to you know, go through a storm while they were going to die. He had to let them get to this point before they were ready to receive this teaching. It's not a cozy pilgrimage, this. Snap your fingers every time you're in need and the miracle worker will turn up and feed you. He lets them get into dark places because until they've got into that place of, of, of emptiness and hunger, he can't, they can't understand what their need is. It, it, perhaps, it's, it, perhaps it's like a man or a woman longing for a partner in marriage. And the traditional understanding, we've pretty much altogether lost this now, the traditional understanding is that God wants that, that hunger for a partner to grow and grow and grow and grow until the, and, and the loneliness to increase until they come to the point that they say, I want to enter the covenant of marriage with somebody. And then that beautiful moment when they become together, become one flesh with one another the closest analogy I can think of. And then with the communion, Jesus gets us, allows us to get to the point that our spiritual hunger is so deep that we know only he can meet the need. As the deer longs, pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. We began the service and we sang the song. We, God wants us to be panting for him and for him alone. Because only he can meet our deepest needs. And so when we come in a moment to the, to the rail, some of you who have got huge needs this morning, huge needs, huge emptiness in the midst of those needs. And at the deepest level, only God can meet that need. And he's poised. His son is poised, ready to meet that need. And as you receive the bread and drink the cup, the bread becomes to you as you receive in faith his body that comes and lives in you. And his blood, the cup, the wine becomes to you as you receive in faith his blood. And as you drink the, may I say the blood? Your sins are forgiven, completely forgiven, once and for all. And he lives in you, not just for the next few hours, but forever and ever. And because we forget, he says, do this in remembrance of me. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. In a sense, you don't need to keep doing it because he died. He did it all on the cross 2,000 years ago. But we need to keep doing because we forget. And we get programmed by the pattern of this world. So we keep repeating the receiving of the bread and the wine as his body and his blood. We keep doing it to reprogram our minds to the pattern of heaven. He is the bread of life. He comes and lives in us. And as we do this, we are filled and we are filled collectively. So together we become ever more fully, wait for this, ever more fully what? The body of Christ. Paul picks up the imagery so powerfully, so beautifully, doesn't he? We become his body. We become the body of Christ in receiving him into us. All of us. His body. His body. His body. His body. His body. 